series in the book of Genesis. Somebody say Genesis. Yes. I don't have a lot on the screen for you today. I'm just going to need your best. I'm just going to need you to take some notes and write down some nuggets. We've been uh, fluctuating from the deep to the practical within these messages. If you remember, uh, if you remember in I talked in the beginning, we talked about Genesis chapter 1, 2, and 3. The first message was progress is in the process. Good, good. You remember that. Progress is in the process. If you missed any of these messages, I implore you to go on Facebook or our YouTube channel and check them out. Progress is in the process. That has still been kind of rocking our household. Different things that are happening. We're learning to be patient with ourselves and God's working on us and we'll say hey, progress is in the process. The next week we talked about God's building blocks and we talked about all the different things and systems that God put into place. We really focused in on the words balance and order. We need balance and order in our lives. Amen? Amen. And last week I talked about the three pillars, kingdom, covenant, and grace. Kingdom, covenant, and grace. But today I want to hit it from a little more practical standpoint. We were at a conference Last week, uh, a lot of our staff were down in Valdosta, and they talked about the importance, one of the topics they mentioned was the importance of teaching us how to operate as Christians, as followers, disciples, like Pastor Shane was saying, in the workplace. How to be a good leader. And did you know that I've been showing you that, that everything we need is modeled in the Bible? God, if he asks you to do something, he will model it for you first. So I would really write that as a nugget in, in, in my brain. If God asks you to do something, go to his word and say, God, show me the model on how to do this. And God's got a model for you. Amen? Amen. So we're going to be looking at Genesis. I'll tell you just a little bit about my story because you might can relate to parts of it. I, I don't share this a whole lot in Cochrane when we were on the mission field, uh, the Peru mission field team last year. We were visiting universities. And we were visiting uh, a lot of leadership uh, classes and, and young students who were engineers and that kind of deal. They had us talk as we were coming in, in as supposedly successful people. I don't know what a successful person is, but we were supposed to be that guy. And that was our interest into the university. And then we would sneakily work our way from success in business to the gospel and living a fulfilled life. Because it doesn't matter how successful you are in business if you die and go to hell and never lived out your purpose here on earth. Amen, House of Grace? Amen. So we did that, and I shared uh, more as somebody from the business world. I used some of the things from my past, and I shared how God, by his mercy and grace, blessed me in my career before I was in the ministry. And I'll share just a little bit of that with you to lead up to something, but I don't say it to like, oh, I'm really awesome, look at me, that's not it at all, not a big deal, nobody's a big deal with Jesus. But, uh, but at the age of 18, I, I began a career, that's kind of young, and, and uh, the insurance company that I work for is now the second largest in the nation, and, and they did an experiment. They said, let's do an experiment and see if we can hire some high school kids. And we'll just see how they do as this little part-time position. And they, they went out on a limb and they hired four of us. And uh, wow, was that a risk. You remember how you were at 18, right? Yes. And uh, you imagine anybody saying, let's hire that guy. But they did. And, and I had lots of different things and, and different things God was doing in my life at the time. And I didn't get into all that today. But I, I, I kind of was writing it down yesterday, trying to track his faithfulness and his, his mercy on my life. And I counted up uh, the promotions that he allowed me to have during that time period. And I counted up one, two, three, four, five. I had six promotions by the time I was 25 years old. And, and God was just really doing things in my life. And, and by the time I was 28 years old, I was a trainer at age 26, getting to travel to D.C. and New Orleans and having job opportunities and getting to pour into people and help people learn. People twice my age, that's humbling. And... Um, by age 28, I was a supervisor in a new department. I had worked in this one department for many years. Many years, you know, when you're 26, it was many years. And, uh, and then uh, they hired me to go to a totally different department. They recruited me over there, and I was a sucker. And I went to this new department, and I worked on the job two months. And then they said, okay, now you're a supervisor. Somebody say supervisor. I'm not sure what that word means, but it comes with a lot of responsibility and stress, and sometimes a little bit more pay. Uh, sometimes not, sucker. And, uh, 
but they put me in a supervisor, and, and they gave me a team of people. And before they gave me my team, they, they quickly removed all the high performers. Thank you very much. They gave me all the ones that were mad at the company and wanted to leave and should have already been fired. And they said, Joey, what can you do with that? I said, I don't know. Probably not a lot. And I, I did the only thing I knew to do is kind of what I was sharing with Deanna the other day. I said, coach them up or coach them out. And I, so I coached them up and I coached them out. Uh, but they coached me more in the process. And what I found myself in was a position of leadership, but I didn't have all the tools in my tool belt that I needed to be a great leader. You ever been there? You ever been put in a position of leadership where you're like, hey, thank you, I think. And, and you've got this team of people and they're looking at you and they're saying, hey, what do I do? And you're like, not sure. But I'll pretend. And, and so you do the best you can. And, and I'm just so glad that I began to learn that I, learned, I did a lot of things wrong and I still make great mistakes as a leader, but I'm trying to be a student of leadership. And I encourage you, you may say, well, I'm not a leader. I would beg to differ. I believe God's got a call of leadership in some arena, in some way, on everybody's life. There's somebody looking for you to lead them. John Maxwell says leadership is influence, nothing less, nothing more. Don't you have someone that you influence? Don't you have somebody looking at you and watching you say, be my model? I know that you do. I know that you do. God's called you to leadership. Somebody say you're a leader. I, uh, I found a few quotes about leadership. I'm going somewhere. We, we won't, this won't take really long, less than two hours. There. <laughs> no, just kidding. I found a few quotes. See, leadership quotes are a dime a dozen. Uh, leaders are a little more hard to find than their quotes. Um, you can quote me on that. I love this one, though. Leaders don't create followers. They create more leaders. That's by Tom Peters. He's an author. Leaders don't create followers. They create more leaders. I love this one uh, by Max Licato. It says, a man who wants to lead the orchestra must turn his back on the crowd. Wow. Say la. How about this one from Ma uh, John Maxwell again? Most people who want to get ahead do it backward. They think, I'll get a bigger job, then I'll learn how to be a leader. But showing leadership skills how you get a bigger job in the first place. Leadership isn't a position, it's a process. I got one more for you. I love this. President Theodore Roosevelt said, speak softly and carry a big stick. You will go far. That's old school. That's old school. Uh, but we've been studying how God was a creator. Uh, and he was almost like, this is a, a, almost an insult, but it's kind of like a modern day inventor. I'm thinking in, in a business sense. He's like a, a, a startup uh, entrepreneur, if you will. But he's created this amazing thing and, and called Earth and the creation of the world. And then uh, now it's time for him to start hiring. He started going from creator to entrepreneur in this startup, and he needs some good help. We ever need some good help. And, and so he. Uh, because there is none, he had to create some, and he named him Adam. So Adam is the first employee, if you will, in our loose, our loose arrangement of this understanding today. So I'm going to read you some scripture, but what I'm going to do is just pull out some nuggets. These are very practical, and I pray that you will just tuck them in your back pocket and think on them and say, God, help me to do this. I want to be a good leader, because I believe whether you're leading your children at home as a homeschool mom, or whether you're a retired grandparent, who's working volunteer at the community, or whether you work at the Air Force Base, it's meaning wherever you work, somebody needs you to be a good leader. Amen? Amen. Men, I know that we're called to lead and we need to be good leaders. Can I get an amen? Amen. So the first thing, uh, these, like I said, they're very practical, and I'll back them up with Scripture, don't you worry. Uh, but the first thing God models for us, if you want to be a good leader, a good boss, a good manager, throw your label on it. I'm going to call it leaders for today. The first thing, and, and I, I tell you, I struggle with this sometimes, but usually when there is a, a breakdown or a disappointment or a meltdown in my relationships, it's because I didn't do this well. The 
first rule of leadership God models for us in Genesis 1, 2, and 3 is give clear instructions. Give clear, specific instructions. Set the expectations very clearly. And you're like, well, can you prove the scripture? I'm so glad you asked. Genesis chapter 1, verse 27. We've read this like three weeks in a row. You should have it memorized. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. Here it comes. Then God blessed them, and God said to them, Be fruitful and multiply. Fill the earth and subdue it. Have dominion over the fish over the sea, over the birds of the air, over every living thing that moves on the earth. So give him very specific instructions. Is that correct? And then... Uh, he also gave him very specific instructions on, there's this one tree, I mean, you got the whole garden, but there's one tree, guys. I need you to stay on, that one's off limits, don't eat of that tree, right? right? The tree of knowledge of good and evil, and that's like 20 sermons, I've preached half of them to you in the past on that tree. I call it the tree of I've got this, the tree of I don't need help, the tree of independence, the tree of I'm pretty smart, I can figure this out. That tree will get you every time. It'll bite you. Don't, don't stay away from that tree. So God gives them very specific instructions on what to do and what's expected and what's, what's off limits. And sometimes when we're in leadership and we wonder, I do this, like I said, I wish I was awesome at all days, but I'm not. But I have to share it with you anyway. Uh, because I can't wait till I master something to share. You'll never learn anything. So this leadership deal, God says, here's the instructions. But sometimes when you have a misunderstanding with somebody, isn't it because you didn't communicate clearly? You ever been there? If you're married, say yes. Because yes. you know you've had this problem. This is a big deal in relationships as well. Of course, we've got to communicate clearly. What are your expectations of me? And what are my expectations of you? And I sat down with, with one of our uh, volunteers just the other week. And I said, you know, things are going great right now. I've learned this from doing this wrong. I said, things are going great right now. But uh, let's sit down and make sure we're on the same page about like what I'm expecting from you and what you're expecting from me. And he said, yeah, and let's also prioritize the things that you want me to do. I was like, I like this guy. <laughs> so that way we're on the same page because what might be a priority to you might not be the highest priority to me. And then you're going to let me down. I'm going to get frustrated. And I'm going to go, what's wrong with them? Don't they know the priorities around here? Have you ever experienced that? Maybe from the other end. You weren't the leader. You were on the team. And your boss was like, hey, why aren't you? Because I didn't know. Because you didn't tell me. God never does that. He'll never have unfair expectations of us. Thank you, God, for being a great leader. i got to move quickly today. I promised I would. Number two, reward them well. I thought that would have got an amen. Reward them well. How many of you want to be rewarded well by your leaders? You can reward in different ways. You can acknowledge, you can pay, you can, uh, there's just benefits, there's so many things. But Genesis 2, do you know God is not a stingy employer? Man, the benefit package is outrageous. 401k forever. Genesis 2, 8 through 15, this was the garden. If you, in case you didn't know, the garden was awesome. Then God planted a garden eastward in Eden, and he put the man there whom he had formed. And out of the ground of the Lord, God made every tree grow that is pleasant in the sight and good for food. Benefit package, baby. The tree of life was also in the midst of the garden, and the tree of knowledge of good and evil. Now a river went out to Eden to water the garden from there it parted, became four river heads. Uh, water is a big deal, right? The name of the verse is passion. The one who goes on to talk about in verse 12 it says, and the gold of that land is good. You want to be in a job where the gold is good. Come on, somebody. <laughs> Bedellium and the onyx stone are there. And it goes and talks about the rivers, how God had more than one stream. And he had onyx, and he had gold, and he had the provision, and he had the tree of life, and he had the food was growing. This was an awesome place. When God brings you to do something, he's going to bring the supply for you to do it as well. Yeah. We've got to take good, take good care of our team if you're going to be a good leader. If you want them to stick around, you don't want another leader trying to sneak off your people because they will. That's right. Amen. Uh, number three, how God is a good leader. Give them authority to do the job. 
step aside. Somebody say, don't micromanage. Uh, I, oh, I had a quote for that. I had a quote for that. General George Patton said, never tell people how to do things. Tell them what to do, and they will surprise you with their ingenuity. God is smarter than General Patton. He thought of this first. He said, Adam, here's what I want you to do. I want you to rule and subdue. I want you to advance. I want you to duplicate my end. I want you to show the world what I look like, how I do things, advance my kingdom, represent me in this earth. And it's going to be awesome. And then God just said, all right, I'll check with you tomorrow. See how it's going. He walked off. I mean, he gave me the assignment, but he didn't say exactly how, what were all the deal. Figure it out. A good leader will allow the followers to learn and figure it out. And sometimes to make mistakes. God is a great leader. Amen? Amen. Give them the authority to do the job and set aside. Now, the flip side of that is number four. Train them as needed. Train them. Don't just give them a job and say, good luck. See you when the annual review time, time comes. And then you won't get a pay raise. And you'll be like, well, why didn't I get a raise? Well, you didn't get a good ready. Why didn't I get a good ready? Because you didn't do this and this. Ever been there? Don't raise your hand. That's the boss that you go talk bad about on Facebook. <laughs> or at the coffee room. But that's not how we need to do it. We need to train them. I love in Genesis chapter 2, verse 19, it's interesting to me, this animal naming deal. I think there's more to it than we can cover today. But it says... Out of the ground, the Lord God formed every beast of the field and every bird of the air and brought them to Adam to see what he would call them. To see what who would call them? Adam. Adam. Do you think God didn't know how to name animals? Was he short on names? Adam, I don't know. Did you think it's something? No. This was a training environment. But God didn't just leave him to himself. He said, you know what? Let's work on this one together. Let me, let me walk you through this. I'm going to hold your hand a little bit. And so Adam gave names to all the cattle, the birds of the air, and every beast in the field. So Adam categorized the species. Adam was very smart. And God was training him on how to be a leader. Somebody say train them. <laughs> Number five, evaluate them. Evaluate them. Now, evaluation can be uncomfortable. And sometimes I have found it uncomfortable to evaluate the team that I lead in different environments, whether it's here or in business, because I know in reality, I didn't do a good job on number one, giving them clear expectations. When I don't give clear expectations, when it comes to evaluation time, I'm going to be squirming more than them because I didn't tell them what I wanted them to do in the first place, and they haven't been doing it, and I didn't have the guts to let them know for seven months. Just helping anybody. Take this to work with you. I know this message is different, but we need to know how to excel as leaders in the workplace. Christians should be the best leaders in the workplace. Evaluate them. Genesis 3, 8 and 9 backs that up. You can read it. Number 6 goes right along with it. Consistent communication. We need to be in communication, not micro-communication, not get on your nerves and drive you nuts communication, not call them while they're at home at 10 p.m. every night communication. I had a friend one time who was a store manager, and he said, I can't even go home. My boss, he leaves, but he never leaves. He blows up my cell phone. How is this going? How is that going? He's like, this person is driving me crazy. So it's consistent communication, but in a healthy balance. Amen? Some of you are like, how does he know my boss? Number seven is very, very important. If you don't hear anything I said, write this one down. Relationship. 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 What do they say? People don't care how much you know until they know how much you... I know we've been saying that since 1980, but it's still just as true as it was when you first heard it. People don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. We heard it at the conference, and I've quoted it ever since I heard him say it years ago. Pastor L.A. Joyner always says, you know, when you're going to bring correction or coaching or whatever you need to communicate with someone, the bridge of relationship is what allows you to get that across to them. If there's no bridge or relationship, then you, you, you don't have as much 
wait on your words as you might think. Well, they work for me. They want to get paid. I get it. I get it. Somebody else will pay them. Somebody else will pay them. If, if, you, if people aren't really working for paychecks, I, do, I know we chase money, but people are looking for purpose. People are looking for fulfillment, and they're looking to be a part of something greater than themselves. They're looking to be a part of a team. If you can be a visionary and lead people in a way where they see where they're going, they'll work for less money to get to a better place for a better team and a better boss. Some of us have taken jobs where we're like, you know what? It ain't even about the money. I can't, I can't stay there. Relationship. Know your team. Now you're saying one thing that I try to tell our team members here at the church is I say, look, I appreciate your gift. You know, I, I recognized Pastor Kelly earlier. I appreciate her gift and the way she pours into the children, that gift of teaching, that gift of leadership. Thank you for the gift. But more valuable than her gift is her. Yes. And your team needs to understand that too, that they are more valuable than the results they bring. Yes. They need to know that you know what their kids' names are. They need to know that you know what their wife's name is, their husband's name is. Now, I'm not saying you have to keep a diary on them, but you need to understand what's going on in their life. Because we're going to talk about a home life affects work life. So we have to know people. We have to have relationships. I'm not saying you have to go golf or go on vacation. That might not be necessary, but you might want to have lunch every now and then in a healthy way. Amen? Y'all okay? Jesus modeled all this. God modeled all this. Okay, um... You're thinking, well, what a relationship? But well, that's not clear in the Bible that God had a relationship with Adam. And he would come and walk with him in the cool of the day. They named animals together. Come on, man. And, and, and they, just, they had a beautiful relationship. <laughs> Number eight. This one's a little tough, too. And we see this in Genesis chapter 3. If you're going to be a good leader, you have to know when to give a second chance. And you have to know when to give a last chance. Hear both of those. You need, the, you need wisdom from the Lord on when to give a second chance and when to say, you know what? Let's try it again. Let me see how I can help you do it better. Let's go over the expectations. Let's get trained up. Let's get coached up. Let's go for it again. And then there's a time we say, okay, that was the last second chance. That was the 22nd second, second chance. We need to help you find a new position. We need to promote you to a different area, laterally, upward, or downward, outward, somewhere. It might not be a good match. It might be my fault. Maybe I did a bad hire. Whatever the case is, you got to have the guts to make the call. And sometimes there's a last chance. God modeled that in Genesis chapter 3 when he came to them when they made the major mistake of the fall. That's an understatement to call it a mistake. It cost us everything and Jesus had to die. But anyway, God came. He, he confronted it right on the spot. He dealt with it. Sometimes we don't have the courage to deal with problems in the workplace. But if you're going to be a leader, you have to do that. Amen? Y'all okay? Yes. All right, number nine. I'm, I'm trying to get this thing for you. Number nine is similar to earlier. Give them what they need to get the job done. Give them what they need to get the job done. That's in Genesis 1.27 and Genesis 2.8, where God supplied everything that Adam and Eve needed. Uh, there's nothing worse than trying to get a job done the other night, I was trying to put some, some flooring into my house, and that's an adventure already if you see me doing anything handy. And, <clears throat> funny story, so I measured that vinyl floor. I laid it out on the living room, and my bathroom is shaped like the letter S, just about, you know? And I cut it every which way, and I measured it once. I measured it twice. I measured it three times. I drew on it. I, learned, I went back in the bathroom, I was writing the measurements on the floor. I mean, I was doing everything I... But it finally came time where I was going to have to make that first cut on the vinyl. Have you ever been there? And for you, some of you guys, that's easy. For me, my brain was like smoke coming out. <laughs> and I said, Laura, baby, stop praying. I'm going to make the first cut. She said, don't worry. I've been praying. <laughs> Thank you for that confidence. <laughs> trying to get the job done, I had my tape measure, and the tape measure broke. I mean, what are the chances? I mean, the tape itself broke. It broke off. It started like seven and a half, you know? And I was like, well, can I? And I was like, no, I can't. And then I thought, well, I got this meter stick, yard stick from the kids' homeschool, and I started, and I was like, man, I need the right tools. That's right. 
if you're going to get the thing done, you need the right tools. And I said, Lord, I know I had a second tape measure around there. Just please remind me where I lost it. And I looked around and God led me to it. God is good. Yes, he is. Because you know what? You're going to need the right tools. And if you're going to be a leader, you need to give your people the right tools. Don't set them up to fail. Don't set them up to get frustrated. They may not fail, but there's no reason for people to be frustrated if they work for you. Take care of your people. Do what you got to do. That's good. Back the people up. I'll never forget one time, this, this one job I had at Geico, we had to keep a call on. We would receive so many voicemails all day long from handling these different claims and people and attorneys and doctors would call. And we had to keep a voicemail on. This one boss I had, man, she was a stickler. She was tough. You ever work with that lady? You're going to learn from that lady. She'll teach you something. And, and she had rules on her team that nobody else had to do. She made me do things that other bosses didn't make me do. You ever work with that person? And then I was like, that's a stupid voicemail. I had to write down every call I ever received, what time I returned it, what we talked about. I was like, this is tedious. I got work to do. But one day I walked by her cubicle and I heard her say, no, sir, let me tell you that Joey did call you back because I have his voicemail log right here. And he called you at 245 on in the second. And what he just told you was, and she let him know what's up. I walked off with him, yeah. <laughs> but you know what? I would have done anything she asked me to do after that. Because I knew she had my back. Yeah. Do you have your people's back? Yes. And when you have their back, they won't talk behind your back. Yeah. Give them what they need. <clears throat> Number 10, give them time to rest. Give them time to rest. Genesis 2 3 talks about how God set up a Sabbath. We know God never got tired, that he modeled the Sabbath rest day, that he sanctified it, the Bible says, so that we would get the rest that we needed because we can't work all the time. And neither can your team learn to give them rest, learn to celebrate, learn to recognize. Number 11, help them find good helpers. Sometimes the job is too great for one of your team members. I love how God looked at Adam and he said, well, that boy's good, but he ain't that good. He's going to need a woman. <laughs> All the ladies are like, yup. <laughs> the men miss their chance. I've got to coach those guys. And she says, yes, I do. The Bible says, he who finds a wife finds a good thing. Amen. Okay, I'll try to help you out. Give me that shot, guys. Good job. Get in there. So God looked at him and he said, you know what? There's no helper suitable for him. We need to make him a helper. So then God says, I'll hire this one. I'll show you how to find good help. I'll train you. But after that, then you'll be able to make your own help. See how I did that? Okay. Yeah. That's the same thing with your teammates. you got to help them find, learn how to find good helpers. Teach them, train them to train. So you can have a, an assembly, you know, a, what do you call it, a farm system there. I almost said assembly line. That's not quite what I meant. All right, have to find your helpers. Number 12, number 12, I mentioned this earlier. Encourage them to have healthy home relationships. There's children in here today. But God created an atmosphere with the man and the woman. That was a great thing. That's right. You can think about that. It was a happy workplace. Everybody was naked. I don't encourage that these days. <laughs> but he told the man and the woman, verse 24, Therefore a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. Again, there's ten summers in there about unity, and then he, he, he's teaching them how to choose each other even over their assignment, wow. even over their job. Who comes first, your job or your wife? Who comes first, your job or your wife? Uh, we don't always get this right, but we need to remember that we, oh, and I got excuses too. I got more than you. That's my spiritual gift. It's excuse making. And, but we have all that well, but I got to bring them to bacon. I got to take care. I got to, I, I get it. I get it. But wives need to know they're chosen. We need to choose them over our jobs. I'm preaching to me now. Have healthy home. What about their kids? Do they get to go to the ball games or are they all 
Well, I know you and kids play basketball. We got a deadline. Yeah, he's got a deadline too. His kids only gonna be eight once. So cut him some slack. Ball season will be over, and you can get a couple Saturdays out of it. But understand the importance of family. Somebody say family. It's very practical. Genesis 2.24 talks about that. I got two more. I'm done. I just got these like late last night. Thought I was down at 12. Number 13. Recognize the enemies of each team member. So you got to know your team. You got to know their strengths. Don't just know what they can do for you. Understand their strengths. Understand their situation. Understand their season. Understand their character. And understand what are the enemies. Because, you know, Jesus has, and we talk about this all the time, John 10, 9 and 10. Jesus says, I, the thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy, but I came that you might have life and life more abundantly. God has a plan for every one of your teammates. Now, we know, of course, that includes salvation, but it's so much more than salvation. That's what Pastor Shane was alluding to today. That's step one. But so does the enemy. What are the enemy's plans for your team? You think he don't know about your team? You think he doesn't know your employees? You think he doesn't know those people you serve? Yeah, he knows them. Got a plan for them. God, give me discernment as their leader. You're the pastor of your team. You might not get to preach, but you can always shepherd. My microphone broke. I said, you, you might not get to preach at work, but you can always shepherd. Leaders shepherd. They protect the flock. There's a time where you can say, hey, you know, I, I see I see right here in your life where this is kind of going this way right here. But let me show you. You might want to consider this. Share some wisdom. Don't let people play with fire in your life. Hey, you know, I, I see you. You and this, the other girl. I see, you know, you, Johnny, and Susie over here. God, it looks kind of like y'all's work relationships getting a little crossing the line, perhaps. You know, and I just want to remind you, this isn't the place for that, and it would affect your job security. And not only that, think about, what about Laura and your wife? What about those two kids? What about, let them see. Be a guardian. Be a shepherd. I don't know what that looks like, but be a good shepherd at your place. Recognize the enemies. If the enemy's laziness, whatever it is, you know, just like when I teach you about parenting, I say, call out character issues on your team. And your kids say, look, it looks like we're struggling with laziness. I love you. I'm committed to you. I'm going to help you. And we together are going to work through this laziness thing. Don't be afraid to call it out. We're not running a black ops operation. Yeah. They need to know what we're working on. Your team needs to know where they stand, what they're working on, what their weaknesses are. If you don't tell them what their weaknesses are, they don't think they have any. Or the opposite. They'll think they're bad at everything. They come to work on, I don't know, I'm bad at everything. And he just don't appreciate me. And they're, not, they're, not. And they're unproductive because they're depressed all day. Mm -hmm. Build them up and know their weaknesses. Last one I have for you is learn to love your team. Learn to love your team. Somebody say love. love. In a healthy way, as a leader, God loves his sons and daughters. He loves he, he came in there, and, and, and some people misunderstand how God came in that day. They say, well, when they heard God come to the garden that day after they had sinned, they, they read it like when, when he says, Adam, where are you? And they're like, Adam, where are you? <laughs> and God didn't come in like that. That's not who he, he didn't say, who told you you were naked? Who told you? No, he came in and said, Adam, I love you so much. This hurts me. I love you.